Well, thank you so much for joining me, Joanna. Um, today we're going to be talking about POTS dysautonomia. And within that dysautonomia term, uh, a lot of conditions that are known by different names probably all fit into that overarching dysautonomia theme, which include POTS, inappropriate sinus tachycardia, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, probably long COVID, etc. So uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. As a doctor, you know, I'm very much a slave to the evidence that is put in front of me. So someone does some research, they say this is what works. I look at that research and then I use that data to treat my patients. There is, however, two things to point out. The first is that there is not that much research and a lot of research that is done is only sort of at the moment driven by some kind of vested interest uh, and therefore there hasn't been very much research done in POTS, dysautonomia, etc. And the second thing is that the research we use is largely evidence-based research and we ignore another kind of research and that is the research that pa the patient does because the patient is on this unimaginable journey and the patient is desperate for any help they can get and what we can provide them is very limited you know so the 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 value of anecdotal evidence uh, is generally underestimated and i think this is where someone like you who has been on that journey who's living that journey every day uh comes in you know i don't think i can ever empathize with my patients like someone like you can because you know what it feels like and you know how lonely and chaotic it can get. So I'm so glad that you're joining me and I am desperate to find out from you all the things that have worked for you. And even if those things work for one other person, then to my mind, that's something really valuable. So today we thought we would talk about three tips on how to improve sleep, sleepers, clearly a major problem in all forms of dysautonomia. And not only is the fact that the dysautonomia affects the sleep, but the lack of sleep then makes the dysautonomia and everything so much worse. And if you can regulate sleep, then, you know, those people who sleep better say everything gets a bit better. And unfortunately, there is very little sleep expertise out there there are very few medications uh, out there which work because in patients with POTS and dysautonomia, the problem is usually not so much going to sleep, even though that can be difficult. The problem is not waking up feeling refreshed and therefore patients, it seems, don't get a restful sleep. They can go to sleep, they can sleep for eight hours, but when they wake up, they say, I feel like I haven't slept at all. And so a lot of the medications that are out there that we use are medications that help people go to sleep, but they don't necessarily guarantee a restful night's sleep. So I would be very interested in learning from you as to what you, as someone who has suffered from this condition, found worked for you and which aided in your recovery. Thank you for having me on. Sleep is a really, really difficult one. So even for myself, um, it was the same thing. I think usually going to bed would always be fine. But then I'd wake up in the middle of the night, maybe 3 a.m. And then I would just feel so, the word I hear very often is wired and tired. I just felt like I was so incredibly alert, but I was so exhausted at the same time. Or later on, it then morphed when I wake up, like something like 5 a.m., two hours before my alarm was supposed to ring both which were extremely frustrating, or I would maybe feel like I slept, but I would wake up just feeling exhausted. So probably I didn't sleep as well as I even think I did. So for that kind of thing with the wired and tired, it was interesting because what I noticed, not only from myself, but also even the, the clients that I work with, is that oftentimes it, the sleep kind of improves, not necessarily in the beginning, it's more the actions that we do like, that throughout the day that then over time improve the sleep. So it's actually interesting, more like focusing indirectly on the sleep is what will improve it long term is what I found. Sometimes too, even for myself, kind of just looking at that kind of tired and wired, again, doing whatever you do throughout the day matters a lot. So, um, for example, pacing is a huge one, actually pacing throughout the day, making sure that you're resting appropriately, making sure that you're pacing your activities appropriately so that when night comes, you do feel a little bit more 
rested and actually are able to sleep. So that's kind of one part. It, it is so incredibly important, not just kind of the last four hours of what you do before you go to bed, but just throughout the whole day and how it, how it goes. Even for me, I noticed too, it was one of those things where I'm not sure at some point when I started feeling better, I started noticing I'm able to sleep better. And I've noticed this with clients too, where sometimes we'll have a few sessions and then they'll come and they'll be like, oh, I'm finally sleeping again after a long time of not being able to sleep. We weren't focusing directly on the sleep. So it's actually a very misleading, kind of a tricky thing. But so when it comes to that, there's something, there's also the sleep hygiene aspect. So kind of, it's really important. I feel like mostly with people with POTS and just people with the subnomia in general, maybe our circadian rhythms and everything else is so sensitive. So it's so important to really stick to a schedule which can be really hard when you're, for example, maybe not able to sleep. So you stay up late and then you wake up late. But that importance of really kind of sticking to a schedule, I would say trying as hard as possible, because I know that even for myself, if there's maybe sometime when I'll go to bed two hours later, like on a weekend, it'll take me maybe half the week to kind of regulate myself into being able to go back to sleep earlier. So the schedule is incredibly important. Kind of to looking, for example, for me, I'm extremely sensitive so even things like any kind of lights at night even like the grocery store lights which could be kind of bright um and then another aspect also would be actually what i've also found some people also have problems with blood sugar um and a lot of people with POTS that i've spoken to also have kind of hypoglycemia where their blood sugar drops and that could also be something interesting where perhaps you know kind of it dips at night and then the autonomic nervous system kind of comes in and kind of tries to pump that up so one other thing that I've kind of felt that has kind of worked with people is when they, um, and for myself as well, kind of having maybe more of a carbohydrate snack at night or something even like, you know, maybe things like bananas too, that will kind of boost the serotonin, make you also a little bit sleepier. Um, so kind of that might, you know, might sound random, but it's little things like that, that kind of, you know, make a difference. Things like yogurt and, or milk or tuna or things like that. Of course, then their sensitivities, that's another problem. Um, and even things, well, for example, with people with POTS, for example, we have to drink quite a lot of water. So kind of paying close attention to how much water you drink right in the evening after a certain time. I would also, I used to wake up a lot during the night to go to the bathroom because I would drink the amount of water that I had to drink throughout the day. So kind of paying close attention to water consumption as well. But I think it's really, really interesting because so much of it comes from kind of the activities you do throughout the day and kind of the pacing appropriately things too with, uh, you know, kind of, again, the fight and flight and rest or digest state, trying to kind of get as much into that throughout the day. To what else is kind of, and then obviously when you wake up, for me, it was also a thing of, I would feel very anxious when I woke up at night because, well, not just because of that kind of the adrenaline rush, but also to like, well, this means that I'm going to have to sleep even less. I'm going to feel even more exhausted. And then, you know, kind of focusing on it, uh, it was really, really tough for me. So kind of to when that would happen, typical things that you kind of hear, I would get out of bed and I would try to really kind of relax or like distract my mind as much as possible and not really think about, okay, the fact that I have to I have to get up in a few hours, really doing things like um, deep breathing, like four, seven, eight was helpful for me when you kind of, you know, take a deep four, four breaths in and then you hold for seven and then you breathe out for eight. Um, so kind of those are, those are a few things. What, how about you? What would have you kind of found that helps some people? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, again, um, a lot of what I do is, you know, I read in journals, etc. But you're quite right. It is the very nature of sleep uh, that is um, so difficult, which is that sleep is so elusive. Even if you don't have POTS and you want to sleep, sleep escapes you. When you crave sleep, sleep doesn't come. And it's only when you're distracted and doing other stuff you know, and then sleep just comes when you're, and sometimes it comes completely uninvited. But when you spend your whole night inviting it, it actually never, uh, never comes into, comes in. So that in itself is difficult. And for a lot of people, you know, they know that they're sleep deprived, they crave sleep, they get anxious about the fact that they're not going to sleep. And that then perpetuates the problem. So that you're very right, that actually, in some ways, what we should be concentrating on is not you know, actively getting anxious and stressed about not being able to sleep tonight because I have this, but actually keep yourself occupied and distracted in other ways and let that sleep hit you uh, 
as and when. And unfortunately, I think also the other thing I was reading somewhere is that, you know, when you lie in bed and you're waiting for your sleep to come, it doesn't come. So in some ways, the best thing then is to go and do something rather than just keep lying in bed and hoping it's going to come. So that I think is interesting. And that's, again, only because I, you know, I tend to suffer from insomnia a lot as just as just so many people now so it is it is a real kind of challenge the second thing uh, that i find interesting is this concept of adrenaline because i was listening to a few people sleep experts in america and they talk about the fact that it is these adrenaline surges that happen and adrenaline is everything that resting and digesting isn't you know adrenaline is completely the opposite so uh, you're quite right where, for example, if you talk to a friend at night and you have a little argument over the phone, well, that adrenaline stays in you and therefore you'll be wired for four hours or five hours or something. And therefore, inherently, it becomes very difficult to go to sleep. And that's where the sleep rituals come in and making sure that you you have your space and you have your uh, quiet and there are no distractions. And that's incredibly difficult in this kind of world that we live in. So that, I think, is you're right. And then there was a guy who was talking about the fact that maybe it is these adrenaline surges that we get at night when we're asleep that wake us up. And maybe, you know, you have to be woken for a certain amount of time to realize you're awake. So what probably happens is blue light flashes well that'll cause a tiny adrenaline surge in everyone not enough necessarily to disrupt sleep but in a patient with a dysautonomia because they react in a hyper exaggerated way to adrenaline um, that maybe that wakes them up and then they go to bed and then they wake up again and then they sleep and they wake up again and therefore they're, they're not refreshed in the morning and he's actually shown that he's actually shown um, heart rates going up uh, and a lot of people have always thought that actually it's the act of waking up that pushes your heart rate up. Perhaps it's the the heart rate going up in response to some kind of external stimulus that actually then causes you to wake up. And that's why a lot of people say, I wake up with my heart pounding, uh, which is interesting again. Um, so, and, the, and this particular uh, doctor, he's a sleep expert. Uh, he talked about using things like beta blockers as adrenaline antagonists, uh, so giving people beta blockers at night, and that perhaps then um, blunts these adrenaline surges, allowing for more restful sleep. So that's uh, interesting. I have tried that in a few patients, and I've had very mixed results. You know, uh, some people say, "Oh, yes, that did help," and other people say, "Well, actually, the beta blocker gave me lots of side effects. It pushed my heart rate too low, which is a really common thing that I hear from patients with uh, POTS and dysautonomia." And then, um, so that, that again is really difficult. I've heard about melatonin and people saying melatonin can help and a lot of people take melatonin. But I, again, have had very mixed results. I'm not convinced that helps. Another thing I heard somewhere is that a lot of patients with POTS and dysautonomia have pain. And, um, you know, whilst we pay attention to pain when we're awake, we don't pay attention to pain when we're asleep. So we don't take our painkillers just before going to sleep. Uh, because we think that sleep will act as that natural analgesic. But unfortunately, if you did have pain, then that pain would probably cause adrenaline to be released. And again, that may um, impact on your, you know, increase the chances of you waking up and making everything worse. So those are all really, really interesting kind of hypotheses. And then I also uh, agree with you about this idea of reactive hypoglycemia, which is really interesting. In fact, I work very closely with an endocrinologist in London who sent me some initial work he'd done, and he was able to demonstrate that uh, patients with dysautonomia, they actually dropped their blood sugars. You know, in the, in, when patients initially used to come and talk to me and say that to me, I used to think, oh, that's probably because they're dropping their blood pressure or their heart rate's going up, and that's why they're feeling it. But uh, this particular endocrinologist was able to show me that actually their blood sugars do drop. Now, the problem there then is that, um, well, the problem with carbohydrates, I mean, particularly complex carbohydrates, is that that causes pooling in the, in the stomach. So if someone takes something really rich in carbohydrates, then you get more pooling in the stomach. And that then paradoxically increases the heart rate, et cetera. So it's a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, but you're right. Simple carbs, uh, you're not simple carbs, sorry. Um, complex, things like bananas, et cetera, would seem like a, 
a reasonable thing as opposed to having lots of bread or cake or something like that i think so that that i think you're right and it would be interesting for people to try it and let us know whether that works for them have you got any other ideas are there any other things that you think would um, work the so sleep hygiene are there any resources we could point people to are there any other things that you know of so sleep hygiene i tell all my patients about meals i tell them all about but i haven't really mentioned trying to take a banana at night before you you know or anything like that uh, melatonin i talk to people about um the pacing is really interesting to me and uh this is something i will start telling my patients about anything else you have that uh, that you'd be happy to share well you know what's interesting is what you were mentioning so many people have so many different everybody's so different right with this you can't mm -hmm. just kind of here you go, your prescription pad, one thing you could do and, and it's good. So it's so unbelievably customized and individual for every person. Even when you were mentioning beta blockers, for me, I used to take them also at night. I was told to take them right before you know, bed or in the evening and yeah, didn't make any, didn't make any difference for me. So it's interesting that for some people it does work, but I think too, for um, even, I think, I don't, I don't think we realize too sometimes how sensitive we can be to certain things. Like even I was talking to a, a client who was saying that when she watches you know, TV at night, she feels like she really gets, you know, really, really kind of like much more riled up than perhaps her partner does. So that's interesting too. I think looking a lot more like you were saying, even with the pain throughout the day, we sometimes tend to block out so many symptoms, you know, we're kind of not really connected to our body, mostly when it's not feeling well, because it's hard to be connected to something that, you know, is not feeling well, you might want to kind of zone it out or shut it out in some way. Mm -hmm. And then kind of when at night, when you're resting, I feel like when everything comes back up to your brain and everything just starts waking you up and causing you troubles at night and kind of trying to get you to tap into it again, which is not something that you mm -hmm. necessarily want to do. So that um, it could be really tough, but kind of, yeah, through kind of, you know, customization, looking really closely at what kind of causes stress throughout the day, what kind of, you know, again, part of an, a, a huge importance of pacing and things like that. And then um, looking at how that uh, that affects sleep, and then things too, kind of experimenting with meals, and yeah. But it's so incredibly customized for me too. Kind of you know, chamomile tea helps a lot, and I have a very specific wind down routine um, that I have at night. Where it, I think yeah, it takes me. Even last night I had a conversation with a friend, and it was a great conversation. But unfortunately, I guess it lasted too long, and I went to bed feeling more. I felt it. I felt a little bit more wired than I would have been. So um, I think to kind of you know being aware of that everybody's sensitivities and how, how it is. Are there any um, sleep tracking uh, applications or something that you could recommend that um, may help people understand what's going on, you know, get an individual assessment of what's going on in their bodies uh, with regards to their sleep? Uh, um, it's interesting things. I'm not sure if I think it also might try to see things like Dalio and there's kind of other symptom tracking apps. Um, I remember I used to use apps like that, but I really don't recall if I ever kind of tracked sleep and things like that. But I remember tracking kind of a lot more you know, symptoms and moods and things like that. And that helps a lot with kind of seeing too, like you mentioned, it's important to see kind of a baseline of what's, what's affecting me, what's helping, yeah. what's working, et cetera. And uh, I, I guess, I mean, other things that I was thinking of, uh, well, there are sort of holistic therapies on there. So I would encourage everyone to embrace other therapies as well, you know, modern day kind of allopathic medicine does not have the answers, does not have all the answers, certainly, uh, and uh, it tends to over-medicate. But so things like uh, acupuncture, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, Ayurvedic medicine, I mean, the, you know, we should be embracing all those things for the sake of the patient rather than saying, oh, my medicine is better than that, and that is witchcraft or whatever, anything. You want to empower the patient and you say, well, look, you know, you're troubled. I have uh, limited options for you. But let me not stop you. And I'm indeed happy to work with other people who think they can help you. Uh, I'm happy to support that the best I can. So yoga, Pilates, all those things, I think acupuncture, all those things are worth experimenting with because who knows, you may find your own individual kind of, um, you know, mix of things that helps i was speaking to a guy yesterday who said reiki he tried reiki and he said well that was outstanding and i mean you know i don't know enough about reiki and i'd never really sort of didn't really know enough uh, so I, in my ignorance i would think oh well who knows uh, but but he was you know and at the end of the day he's what matters right he's the patient if he's happy if he feels that it works great you know who am i to say to 
to cast judgment on that. I, I should just be happy for it. So um, in terms of medications, I think the things that I've found, the, there's a medication called Mestinon, pyridostigmine. That seems to improve some people's sleep because it is a rest and digest enhancer. So I use that quite a lot. Again, very limited. Um, you know, it's not like everyone works it, but it helps. Fluids seem to help people. I think if you give them intravenous fluid, they feel so much better. They feel so much more relaxed. They're able to, you know, they just feel so much better. They sleep better, et cetera. And I think, I don't know whether you've had any experience with LDN, low-dose naltrexone, which is another medication that they use. I, I've heard a lot about it, but I haven't, mm -hmm. I, I personally haven't. And I, I've just, same thing, kind of heard of anecdotes here and there from people mm -hmm. that have had pretty good uh, results with it. So again, like, like you mentioned, that's, that's the whole thing to be as customized individual as possible. Yeah. Even for myself, I did, I did Reiki, I did acupuncture, I did Ayurveda, I did traditional Chinese medicine and all of these, well, I felt like they did help. Um, Good. So why not, why not give it a try? Absolutely. It's better than waiting for six months to see a, a medical practitioner like me and then spending 10 minutes with me and then you're on your own, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So why not have all those other, why not build that team around you of people you trust who can come to your problem from different perspectives and offer you different options? Um, I think all those things can help. Magnesium can help. I think magnesium improves sleep patterns for a few people. So that again is another thing that could help. But and what about CBD oil? Have you ever come across uh, anyone using CBD oil? Is does that help? Um, so it's interesting. I used, I used to take um, kind of anti-anxiety medication sometimes at night because I felt like that would help. Um, and then once I kind of stopped doing that, I did start using CBD oil when I was in in Switzerland, and it. For me personally, I felt like like it did help, and I used it okay. for for a while. I no longer use it, but at that time, I feel like it, it did help. So, again, good, great. So, so in summary, your three tips. Um, having spoken to, just give me your top three tips, and then um, we'll we'll end this conversation. So, number one would be oftentimes you'll find that your sleep might improve once your other symptoms improve which can sound disheartening, but that also means that it's positive. It's an optimistic thing that it will get better. Two, um, kind of paying attention to this tired and wired thing, looking at what you do throughout the day matters so much, really how you kind of leave your days. And three, everything having to do with sleep hygiene, with a consistent sleep schedule, maybe what medications are you taking? What supplements are you taking? How are you, how are, how is your wind down routine? Everything having to do with kind of a proper good sleep hygiene. Wonderful. There's one resource that uh, there's a there's a online uh, program called Sleep Station that people may be interested in. It's a program that any GP can refer any patient to. And I think it's a six week program where they work with patients to improve their sleep. And I think it's a free service. So maybe that's something that um, patients may find useful. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your insight. And uh, hopefully now that we're working more um, collaboratively, you know, I think you do an amazing job. And I think we need more health coaches. I think we need because because what you offer is something that we don't. And it has a real value to it. Thank you for having me on. And this is it's so wonderful to kind of see medicine evolving in this way where it's a collaborative effort. Great. Thank you.